I believe that's right. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Amen. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Now, Brother Brennan. Thank you, Brother Borden. Let us bow our heads just a moment now for prayer. If we have any requests, let's raise our hands to God and quietly in our hearts say, God, remember me. Our Heavenly Father, we have assembled tonight again one more day closer to that great time when you'll pull time into eternity. We've had the privilege of living today and seeing many of us and hearing and having our senses, feeling the Spirit of God in our heart. We're grateful for it. Tonight, just before the meeting, hearts has been warmed and the hands has gone up. Expectation tonight is great, Father. Help us now to receive what we ask for. I ask that you'll magnify your Son, Christ, before the audience tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask that. Amen. You may be seated. You're such a nice audience and so nice to talk to. I've been talking too long, keeping you too late. Tomorrow afternoon is our closing service. I truly believe the Holy Spirit has proved to us that he's here. Now, let's push everything we can now. Prayer and be ready for whatever he has for us that we will receive it. Now, there's many visitors here. There are some here from other parts of the country. Now, in the morning, attend Sunday school. These men here are servants of Christ. They are people who believe in this same ministry that I preach. They are ministers, fellow workers, citizens of the kingdom of God. They have churches here. They'd be glad to have you tomorrow morning to attend their churches, each one. And you know, I guess they've made that statement. But I always say this. It's a sin to send your children to Sunday school. How many knows that? It's a sin to send your children to Sunday school. You have to take them. <laughs> so be sure to do that. Go with your children tomorrow to Sunday school. These men perhaps have a church organized in good situation to take care of any age and all the young and old and what alike. You'll hear the word of the Lord. And I pray that each one of their churches tomorrow will be so filled with the Holy Spirit. Those signs, wonders, miracles and things will take place in their church. And there will be a great glory and honor given to our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust it with all my heart. Now, quickly, to get right into the message for tonight, and want to be sure now, tomorrow afternoon, uh, I think it's 2 o'clock or 2.30 or something, and how many prayer cards? Do we have many prayer cards out? We got to make these, you know, we got to pray for them. Every person gets a prayer card gets prayed for. And they'll be giving out prayer cards tomorrow afternoon about an Oh, a while before the service starts, I'd say at least 45 minutes, so they won't interfere with the with the evening or the afternoon uh, uh, service. So the boy will be here and he'll have someone with him to help and they'll be giving out their prayer cards about maybe a half hour anyhow or maybe a little more for anybody that wants a prayer card and we'll pray for everyone we can. I've been trying awfully hard but with my hand on the Bible tonight and there's people here with me, who knows? Now, these meetings up and down the coast has been test meetings. I'm leaving for the mission fields. If ever I come back again, it'll be a different kind of service than what I've held. I'll be praying for the sick alone. See, I, it, the discernment don't go with the people of America. The intellectual people, they don't see it. One of those things can happen in Africa, and 20 and 30,000 will rush the altar at once. But we are somewhat like... A lady was noticed in our country in a 10 cent store not long ago. She was trying to show a little boy everything and ought to attract the little boy's attention. And after a while, she'd pick up little bells and jingling, and he just stared, just looked right out. And finally, the lady got so overcome, she just fell across the counter. Some of the people standing there walked up to her and wanted to know what was the matter. She was crying. 
She said, it's my little boy. She said, some time ago, he just set, started sitting staring and said nothing that should attract a little boy of his age never attracts him anymore. He just stares in space. That's about the way the church has gone. God has shook every spiritual gift that can be shook. It's mentioned in the Bible before him. And they just stare. Well, I guess it's all right. Perhaps, I guess it's so. Reminds me of an old poet in English, an English poet, I forget his name. He was writing, always he loved the sea, but he had never saw it. So one day he was going down to the sea and he met an old sailor coming from the sea. He said, where goest thou, my good man? He said, I go to the sea. He said, I've wrote of it, but I've never seen it. He said, I long to smell its briny waves. I like to see the white caps as they break, hear the seagulls as they fly. And the old salt sailor with beard on his face pulled out his corn cob pipe and spit. He said, I was born on it 60 years ago. I've been there ever since. I don't see nothing so thrilling about it. What is it? He had saw it so much till it become common to him. That's what's married with us Pentecostal people. We've seen so much of the glory of God until it's become common to us. It doesn't stir us no more. I have tried so hard. This is my closing American meeting. I was definitely felt to come here to this country. I took this fine bunch of man the other morning to breakfast and never met such a fine bunch of man. Any better man in my life. Real spirit man. Hearts full of love for their people. They're pastors, shepherds. You don't know the fight that these men has fought to bring this meeting here. That's right. But they want it before their people. They're interested in their people growing in the grace of God. And they're trying to get them to know more about God. And when they hear of something of God, examine it and think it's right, they bring it before their people regardless of what the price is to pay. I got honor and respect for such man. Amen. That's right. And we've had laying on hands and meetings. We've had that since years and years and years and years. John Wesley prayed for the sick. Calvin, Knox, Spurgeon, all down through, they prayed for the sick and laid hands on the sick. In come the Pentecostal with speaking with tongues and interpretations, and so forth and on. But never have we ever seen what the Holy Spirit's doing for us right now. See? And that's what I'm trying to get to the people, that you don't have to wait till some special gift comes through the country. Christ is ever-present with His church. What if you're laying out here on the road bleeding to death in an accident? Then you say, I have to say and get Brother Brandon, Brother Roberts, or somebody come pray for me. Christ is right there, ever present. See? That's what I'm trying to get the people to see. But after trip after trip across the nation, it still remains the same. And so far as I know, unless Almighty God reveals to me to do different, this will be my last meeting in America, in the United States, under discernment. I will always preach and pray for the sick. When I go into other countries, I'll use that because you never know, never will know what that does to me. It weakens me. One vision will tear me up longer than more than standing here for three hours preaching. Yes. And I do it relaxing myself to find what will take place. And it's, it just doesn't take. That's all. I stood in South Africa one afternoon between about around 200,000 people. A platform, something similar to this, built for a racetrack. I had to build it on the other side of the racetrack. Stood up there. No way of giving out prayer cards. There was just thousands times thousands. We had no one. I had the missionaries go down and get one person out of your tribes that you're preaching to. They lined up a group of people. The first to come across the platform was a Mohammedan woman. Red dot in her forehead, as you know, of thoroughbred Mohammed. And I said, what did you come to me for? You're the Mohammed. She said, I am. I said, why did you come to me as a Christian? She said, because I think you can help me. Spoke pretty well English. And I said... Did you ever read the New Testament? She said, I have. And I said, then you've seen what I've just got through speaking about, that what he was the same yesterday? She said, yes, sir. I said, then if the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, then you'll know that your Mohammedan prophet cannot do that. He's dead and buried. But Christ, the Son of God, has raised again and living forevermore. She said, if he can reveal like he did in the New Testament there, as it says, I'll accept him as my Savior. And when I said, looked at her again, I said, you have a cyst on the womb. Your husband's sitting right out there. He's a tall, thin man, but she was with a doctor a few days ago with a black mustache, heavy set, wearing a gray suit. And he examined me with a female organ and said, on the ovary, you have a cyst. She said, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And 10,000 Mohammedans come to Christ at that moment. Before I went over, I spoke at a Kiwanis club and some ministers was present. And they was talking about one man there. He'd been there 20 years and said that precious jewel had turned one Mohammedan. 
Then they told me that I was crazy. And what they call crazy and what they call psychology and uh, mental telepathy or an evil spirit or something turned more Mohammedans to Christ than one five minutes time in all the intellectual tracks and everything's been passed in 150 years. Amen. There you are. Next, come on a platform is a little cross-eyed boy. While looking at him, I said, now, I don't have any power to uncross his eyes. You know I don't. I'm Mr. Man. Look at the little fella. And I said, but now, as far as his life, looking at him. And so then, while I was speaking, the little boy, I said, he come from a, from a Christian home because in his hut, as you go in the door, there's a picture of Christ hanging on his right side of the door as you go in. His mother and father is Zulus, but he is, they're rather thin, tall people. And they stood up way back, maybe a city block back. And that was right. I said, now the mother, she showed the father as soon as the baby's eyes was open, his born cross-eyed. I looked back and the little fellow standing there, his little belly out, no clothes at all. And there he stood there looking like that at me. And when I looked back, his eyes as straight as mine. I said, anyone sees his eyes as straight. Passed him on through. How many ever heard of Dr. F.F. F. Bosworth, old brother Bosworth, one of the godliest old men I ever met in my life? There he was standing on the platform. I heard him trying. How many ever know to earn Baxter, a real theologian, a brother in Christ? was standing there alone, and a British doctor was disputing, come up there and said, what'd you do to that baby? Did you hypnotize him? And I said, and then the British government give you license to practice medicine, know more about hypnotism than that. If hypnotism will straighten a baby's eyes as crossed, you doctors better practice hypnotism. I said, well, Mr. Branham, I put the baby on the platform down there, and the baby's eyes were crossed, and here he's standing here under his hand, says his eyes are straight. Something happened between there and here. And I said, yes, he met Christ. Now, he said, a great big lily. Some of you ladies like lilies. Some of them lilies there are 18 inches across. And there are the big uh, bouquets of them across the platform. Uh, he said, I know God's in that flower. I'm taught to believe that. It's life. We can't produce it. That's true. But said, if see tangible enough to make that boy's eyes come uncrossed. Mr. Bosworth put his hands on him and said, Sir, you're going to cause a riot. Look out in there now. I said, you're taking up too much time while our brother's under anointing. We'll have to ask you to leave. He said, just a minute, Mr. Branham, what happened to that boy? Is Jesus Christ tangible enough to uncross him eyes? I said, you'll have to take my word. He was standing right there. I haven't even touched him. The faith of that father and mother out there in this child, his eyes are straight. He pushed everybody back and walked up to the platform, held up his hand and said, then I accept Christ as my personal Savior. And when I was leaving, about 25 or 30,000 out the airplane waving goodbye, this little fellow jumped over the lines that was there and run out there, hugged me around the neck, and began to speak in tongues. And he said, I've left. Now I'm going to be a medical missionary to the natives back in there under the Pentecostal setup. Praise the Lord. Oh, my. That afternoon, one standing there, just one more case. I won't have time to tell it. But when that happened... I said, how many of you want to receive Christ as personal Savior? I want you to raise your hand. 30,000 stood. 30,000 blanket natives. Didn't know which is right and left hand. Women stand there with no clothes on. Just a clout. Four inches wide. Beads. And uh, someone said, I believe they meant physical healing. I said, I did not mean physical healing. Are you convinced that the Bible, and I've just told you what he was, is the God that's doing this. Every one of them raised their hands up. I said, if you're sincere, break your idol on the ground it's like a dust storm. Like that. And 30,000 blanket natives received Christ as their Savior at one time. And the next morning, Miss Sidney Smith, the mayor of Durban, South Africa, called me up and said, go to your windows, face the seashore. Right quick, you'll see something you've never seen. And there comes 17 truckload, big vans, and there's longest from here to where it says exit over there. Just full of, I made one prayer, congregational prayer, for that thousands times thousands, just oceans of people. You've seen the picture of it. And then, that's transposition in this thing. And when you, when you look there, and I looked out there, and they was laying out there, and I just stood and raised my hand and made one little prayer of about five minutes over every one of them and said, if you believe that that spirit that knows the secrets of the heart is the God of the Bible, then accept your healing. And the next day, I looked out the window, and 17 of those big van loads coming down, and those natives that is laying in those things that they were packing them in, and clubs and wheelchairs and stretchers and everything else was walking behind this thing, and all things are possible, only believe. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Dr. F. F. Bosworth is one of the most honest men I ever seen. He would never hit underestimate instead of overestimate. He said, Brother Branham, when I seen that massive thing take place, he said, I could say with my hand on the Bible that I'd underestimate 25,000 outstanding miracles took place at one time. And we turn our heads and walk away and say, Well, I guess it's all right. They'll raise and condemn us. That's right. That's right. You're my people. I'm Anglo Saxon. You're, you're my people. You're the one that I, uh, you're, you're like me, you're a white man, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, but your education has ruined you. It's exactly right. It's got you away from God. It always does. Yes. Education's the greatest enemy the gospel ever had. I say that with all my heart. It's the greatest enemy that the gospel ever had. It's a lot harder to deal with the educated heathen than one that's uneducated. Let me tell you something. Right in that same place. Now, I asked these people, I said, don't wait now until you go learn languages. Go tell everybody in your tribe. I've got newspaper clippings where I forget how many loads of firearms and things that they had stole just in the Shungai tribe, brought them back. The mayor of uh, the paper of Durban packed it that they were through with sin. And notice, let me say something just not to be sacrilegious, but to be brotherly and godly and warningly to you. Them women standing there stark naked. With nothing but a cloud on. And as, as quick as they received Christ as their Savior, they walked away from there with their arms folded. Answer my question, somebody. If just receiving Christ will cause a, a woman that doesn't know right and left hand to realize she's naked, how can we call ourselves Christians and constantly stripping the clothes off all the time? There's something wrong somewhere. Let us pray. Heavenly Father... I've tried hard. I've done all I know. The rest is to you, Father. I, I just, I pray you help us now as we read your word, as we speak. Whatever you've called, you surely, it will come. I commit it all to you with myself. These few words is laying here before me. I pray that you'll sanctify it to honor you. I'm sorry I'm holding your people too late. And I pray, Father knowing that the revival's over and people weary easy. I, I'm sorry if I have done anything wrong. I pray that you'll help me tonight and let us see thy word once more in its light. Then heal the sick and save the lost. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. St. Matthew 12. Begin with the, at the 38th verse. You're, you're so nice. I just hate that. I hate the... I have to squeeze myself, see? And we're used to revival time. When we preach all night, pray all night, night after night, see, all the time, going constantly. When a revival breaks, it's just day and night, day and night. I don't mind you missing a day's work. That's all right. But I don't want you to miss Sunday school in the morning. <laughs> don't, don't miss Sunday school. If you have to miss a day's work, I won't feel too bad about that. Because all them things are perishable anyhow. But don't miss Sunday school. I'll let you out early so you can go to Sunday school. 38th verse of the Matthew 12. And there were certain of the scribes of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks after sign. And there shall be no sign given unto it, but... The sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the man of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. I want to take a little text from there. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus had been... I'm setting my watch to alarm, so I know I won't be over time tonight. Um... Jesus had been rebuking the cities that he had come out of 
and had done his works and signs, he had been rebuking them because they had not believed him. If you'll read the previous chapter, the 11th chapter, and read the 12th chapter, you'll see in there were those people that ought to have known the day that they were living, they did not know it. They failed to recognize it. And instead of knowing just exactly the day and the sign that would be in his day, he even rebuked him, said, you can discern the face of the skies. But the sign of the time you cannot discern. If you would have known me, you would have known my day. Now let's just try to drink every whit of this in tonight. And I know it's different. These texts has formed different enough uh, than what maybe you've been listening to. But I want you to try to listen close tonight. See, they were, they were trying to, to have their own idea and not scripturally listen to him. For he had said to them, why don't you search the scriptures? For they are they which testify me. In them you think you have eternal life. And they testify of me. And if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. They couldn't believe him being God and yet being a man. He said, if you can't believe me as a man, believe the works. Let the works testify if you can't believe me. If they say I'm born illegitimate birth and I have no education, I never appeared in any of your schools and so forth, and you can't believe me because I never come up under your doctrine or so forth, why, well, believe the works that I do. They testify of me. What a rebuke to a, a, a people. Now, notice all the cities he had been to him. He had been rebuking Capernaum. Thou art exalted into heaven, but shall be brought down to hell. If the mighty works had been done in you, that uh, was done in you, had been done in Sodom, it would have been standing yet today. And he began to talk one to the other of how that somebody's sick there, if some of the brethren will take her out and uh, take her, pray for her. Just hold your hands on her, brethren. Let me pray for her right here. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for the sister. Let the power of Almighty God be upon her and deliver her, Lord. I ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, what did she's got real sick because of condensed around there with the a crowd sitting around her. There's a man sitting here right here looking right at me, suffering the same thing. So just, if you want to take her and walk her around or take her out and let her get a little air and things and bring her back, it'll be all right. Now, while they're doing that, you listen to what we are, are trying to say here. Now, notice, you may have to pack her because she's fainted. Now, notice, Jesus said that he was rebuking those people because that they had had done turn him down in the things that he was doing and they couldn't understand it and he was telling them about it now God was getting back at them on because of their unbelief now we know this that in every generation that's been on the earth God has always showed his gifts and signs and wonders of confirmation of his word always and people are, even in the Old Testament, in the days that Jesus was referring to here, he really, honestly, they depended more on the sign than they did on the theology. Yes. Because if the theology, no matter how great it seemed to be and how right it seemed to be, if the Urim Thunder didn't speak that it was right, it was wrong. See? They depended on the supernatural sign, but the supernatural sign just couldn't come on anything. It had to come according to the Word. Amen. Now, that's the way we have to watch today. Yes. We have all kinds of signs, but it's got to be signs from the Word's promise. Amen. The promise of the Word to do this. And we know that in this day, we can look for things that's not right. Sure we can, because Satan's thrown his whole army out there to do everything he can do to stop it. But he'll never do it. The Word of God will prevail. It'll go right on. So he'll never stop it. That's one thing sure. Now, God always sent them signs and told them to believe their prophets and so forth in the Bible. Then Jesus shared while he was standing there, after he had done so many things, then here comes these Pharisees up and said, Master, 
we would seek a sign from you. When they had seen him do exactly what the Bible said he would do, and that they come back again and said, we would seek a sign from thee. And he looked at him, I imagine, kind of discouraging, and said, a weak and an adulterous generation seek after a sign, and they shall receive no sign, but the sign of Jonas, meaning Jonah the prophet. As he was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I want you now watch what kind of a generation would seek for this sign. A weak, wicked, unbelieving, adulterous generation. How many knows and theologians and scripture readers that knows that always the Bible has a compound answer? It always answers and answers again. It repeats itself. It can never die. It's the eternal Word of God. And here in Matthew, the, um, the uh, third chapter, he said here, he said, Out of Egypt I, it might be fulfilled, which is spoke of the prophet. Out of Egypt I've called my son. Run your margin reading and find out what that was. It was Jacob, his son. Yes. But it also referred to Christ, his son. Amen. It always has a compound answer. Now, Jesus, of course, was referring to that generation, but any wicked and unbelieving, adulterous generation. And if this wouldn't meet its qualification, this generation we're living in today, worldwide, I don't know what did. We're living in the time of one of the most unbelieving, adulterous generations that they're ever known. I picked up a paper as I flew over Hollywood here not long ago, or Los Angeles, and was reading where that 74 major crimes was committed every night. Major crimes. In one city, Los Angeles. I was reading in a Chicago paper not long ago where 25,000 abortion cases was recognized in the city of Chicago per month. Think of it. And were homosexual on this West Coast had increased 30% since last year. Think of it. A adulterous generation. Oh, if we just had till about 2 o'clock in the morning to dig into that. Wickedness. Adulterous generation. That would be the kind. And they would get it. What was it? The sign of the resurrection. Amen. Now where are we at? As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Many people today think he's still there. But he's not dead. Amen. He's risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And here with us now, appearing among us, proving himself. Yes. Up and down the coast, around the world, Amen. everywhere that he lives. Amen. And the wicked and an adulterous Amen. generation sees a sign that Jesus Christ is alive and not dead. A wicked and an adulterous generation will seek after a sign and they'll get it. The sign of the resurrection. Amen. Let it soak real deep now. Study hard. While you're letting that soak, I want to ask something about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Many people condemned Jonah and say, well, he was an old backslider. He, he wasn't backslid. A man of God, the steps, the footsteps of the righteous is ordered of the Lord. Do you believe that? And I don't care what the man of God does, if he's ordained of God, he might do things that he thinks is crazy to himself. But if you only watch, it works right out exactly right. If he just goes the way he's led. Now, God told Jonah to go down to Nineveh, a city about the size of St. Louis. Wicked, oh my, and perverted, perverse, everything was wrong with him. He said, go down there and cry out against him. And he went down to the ship and bought himself a fare instead of going to Nineveh perhaps was not any ships going that way so he just goes over to Tarsha I do not believe that it was foolish after I got the real revelation of it and see what happened and read the books on it 
and I see where he was right. And on the road out into the sea, he got in trouble. And the storms come up. And they thought the ship was going to sink. And Jonah told him it was his fault. Tie his hands and feet and throw him overboard. And God had prepared a whale to swallow him. Now, some years ago, about 25 years ago, they brought the, the frame of a whale to Louisville, Kentucky. That's just across the river from where I live. And they had how big its mouth was and some little professor standing there that had more education. He had gumption to control. So he was telling all about this whale. And he said, now, you've heard the old legend about uh, uh, the whale swallowing Jonah. He said, if you'll notice, you couldn't put a baseball in his throat. said, it isn't no such a thing. Ah, uh, I was just too Irish to stand for that. So I said, I'd just like to say something to you, fella. There's one thing you missed. That whale might not be able to do it, but if you notice, God prepared this one. This was a special kind. Amen. You could have thrown the whole boat down his throat, maybe. Yeah. See? God prepared a fish for Jonah. Yeah. See? He was a special built, <laughs> built to order, to swallow the prophet. And, he, and it was no such a thing. People, uh, a little, uh, it isn't no place to joke, but I, I was a little girl who got saved, and she's going up the street hollering, praise the Lord. And singing, her little old hair pulled back, her face shining like a peeled onion. She was having a glorious time. And the infidel was standing on the corner and said, What's the matter? I said, I got saved down there a while ago. Praise the Lord. So what you got over your heart? I said, the Bible. I said, I guess you believe it. I said, sure, I believe it. I said, you believe that story in there about Jonah? I said, sure, I believe that story about Jonah. He said, you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? She said, oh, yes, if the Bible said, said it, Jonah... Swallowed the whale, I believe it. And said, um, oh, I said, how are you going to prove it any other way by, by faith? Yeah. Why, she said, when I get to heaven, I'm just going to walk up and talk to Jonah about it. Said, then what if Jonah isn't there? Said, then you'll have to ask him. <laughs> yes, that was enough. <laughs> yes. So a little child, but yet God is able. So Jonah was thrown out of the ship. And the whale, prowling through the waters to find his food, he swallowed Jonah. And anyone knows like feeding your goldfish. When the little fish feeds and gets his little belly full, he goes right down to the bottom of the pitcher where you got him in the little vase, and he rests his little swimmers on the bottom. He's eat. He's resting. And this fish, when he swallowed this preacher, he went down to the bottom of the sea, to rest. I don't know how many fathoms deep it was, but he was laying down there. And I'd like to speak about this now. You know, you, you find so many people that rely upon symptoms. Well, I was prayed for. I got a crippled hand. I was prayed for, but I, I really believe God, but my hand's no better. It'll never be no better as long as you look at that hand. Hey? You're looking at the wrong thing. You must look at his promise. Some time ago, an aged old couple come and wanted me to come pray for their boy who was dying with black diphtheria. I didn't, couldn't go and kept waiting. And a couple of days later, his old fellow said, my boy's dying now. And finally, after service, I went. The doctor wouldn't let me go in. And he said, no, you have children and I can't let you go in because that diphtheria is contagious. And said, you couldn't do him no good. And I, talking to the man, found out that he was Catholic. And I said, uh, if the priest was here, if, if that boy was Catholic, and, and this father had come and got me and I was a priest, he said, that's different. He said, you see, a priest is not married. I said, you'd let him go and take, give him the last rites, wouldn't you? He said, yes, but the priest is not a married man. You've got children. I said, if I take the responsibility on myself, I'll sign a paper. I'll take the responsibility. Finally, I talked him out of it. He dressed me up like a Ku Klux Klan with all kinds of stuff on me and sent me in there where this boy was. Now, it got into heart, something wrong with his heart. The cartogram showed that his weight down had just beaten so many times per minute. And the old mother and father stood there beside the boy. I got on one side of the bed, and I'm on the other, and a little nurse stood there watching us. Fine-looking little lady of about, oh, I guess, 25 years old. And so I put my hands up on the boy and prayed. And this asked a common prayer. 
And when I said, Amen, the old father grabbed the mother and began to hug her and him hug each other. They said, Oh, mother, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing our boy. The boy was just as bad as he ever was. And they just wiped the tears from each other's eyes and just praised God. And that little nurse standing there, she couldn't understand that. And she said, Sir, it's all right, I guess, that I don't belong to your religion, but uh, your kind of religion. She said, But I want to ask you something. How can you act like that? You and the mother of this child act like that, and that boy laying there dying. He said, Madam, the boy is not dying. Why, she said, He's been in a coma for three days. And some kind of a machine there showed that this hand ever dropped that far. Never in medical history did it ever come back again. The old father, I'll never forget it, wiped his eyes and walked over and put his hands on that young woman's shoulder. He said, child, he said, you're taught to look at that machine. And that's all you know about is watch that machine. He said, that, that's all that machine knows is tell what's going on here. That's true. He said, you're looking at that machine, but I'm looking at a promise that God made. Depends on what you're looking at. That boy's married and got two children. <laughs> see, it just goes to show, see, he laid like that another two or three days, but he come right out and got well. See, it just goes to show what you're looking at. You've got to see what you're looking at. Don't look at your symptoms. If anybody had symptoms, Jonah had it. Now, remember, he was in the belly of the whale. Let's say he was 20 fathoms deep out there in the ocean. His hands tied behind him, his feet tied, and in the belly of the whale, laying in the vomit of the whale in his belly. Sea weaves all around his neck. Now, that's really some symptoms. If you look this way, it was a whale's belly. That way it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked was whale's belly. Now, that's really symptoms. There isn't any of you that bad off tonight, I'm sure. That's right. Not that bad off. Everywhere he looked, it was a whale's belly. But you know what he said? There are lying vanities. Amen. I won't believe them. Yes. What did he say? Once more will I look to your holy temple. Yes. Turned over on his back and faced the best he could towards the temple. Why? When Solomon dedicated that temple, he prayed that day when the pillar of fire come in and went down behind the holiest of holies. Solomon prayed and said, Lord, if your people be in trouble anywhere and look towards this holy place, then hear from heaven. And he believed it. And God did something. I don't know what he done. He might have put an oxygen tank in that whale's belly. I don't know what he done. He kept him alive for three days and nights and delivered him at his course where he was supposed to go. And if Jonah under those circumstances, could believe in a prayer that was made by a man that later backslid because of women, as Solomon, and believed on a temple that was built with the hands of man, how much more ought we tonight look to Christ who's sitting at the right hand of God with his own blood, making intercession upon our confession? How we ought to believe it. Nothing, no symptoms stand in the way. I'm looking towards God's promise that he said he would do it. That's the only thing. Look at that. There he was. I read his story only one time. All the people in Nineveh was heathens. Heathens usually worship animals and life way down there in South America. I noticed them doing a kangaroo dance. They had a dance, some kind of a party, and they all dance just like the kangaroo because that's everything you'd ever see. It's a kangaroo. So they was going to eat the kangaroo directly, and they threw him on the fire and singed him a little. <laughs> oh, how they done it, I don't know. I wasn't hungry. So then, um, anyhow, they, the way they was dancing, it's like the kangaroo dance. That's the way they, and you see them come through Africa. They got all kinds of little funny looking things of animals, sprinkled with blood. Well, that's what they believe to be God. And now, we find out that these people down there in Nineveh also worshipped idols. And their sea god was a whale. So all the men, the occupation being by the sea, they were fishermen, the main occupation. And it was a great export there of fish to the world at that time. So then uh, all the fishermen was out there about noontime one day fishing, pulling in their nets. And all at once, the God come up out of the sea, the whale God. He ran up to the shore and licked out his tongue. And the prophet come walking right off the tongue of the whale, right out on the shore. No wonder they repented. <laughs> Amen. God knows how to do things. Amen. Yet in its simplicity, God knows how to do it. Yeah. See? Jonah wasn't backslid. He was just following the leading of the Spirit. That's how to make the people repent. He said, he walked right down through the city. He said, if you don't repent in 40 days, this place will sink. That's all. See, how could they do anything but repent? Because their very, their very God spit the prophet out. And they know he had a message. That was their God. So they just spit it right out. Our God is Christ. Yeah. Amen. And he sent down the Holy Ghost. Why can't we believe it? Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder, 
Here he was, manifested in flesh. There he stood, and he said, And the people of Nineveh will arise in the last day with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And a greater than Jonah is here. Then asked him for a sign. Then he goes on to say about them that God, through all generations, folks, whenever God sends a gift to the earth and the people receive it, that's a golden age for that generation. But when they reject it, it's chaos for that generation. Now, what if tonight, if the American people who claim to be a Christian nation, what if all we who claim to be Christians would accept God's gift that he sent to us? Amen. The Holy Ghost. Yeah. What do we want to do? Amen. Well, we could quit making missiles while there wouldn't be nothing in the world ever hurt us. They couldn't. We have protection. The Holy Ghost is upon us. Yes. Certainly, we wouldn't need nothing else but the Holy Ghost right, right. if the people would just accept the gift that God sent them, and that's the Holy Spirit. But one church will differ from the other, and this and say, oh, there's no such thing as the Holy Ghost. That was for the disciples. And it's a gift right now. Yes. It's for the church, and now's the last days. Why, you don't have to talk about bomb shelters. People are digging under the ground like moles trying to get away from the atomic bomb. How are you going to do it? Right. Why, they'll blow a hole in the ground about a mile deep and for 150 miles square. Well, if you was a 50 miles below the earth, plumb below the, the lava, the shock of it would break every bone in your body. Yeah. There's no way of all of escape, only one way. Yeah. But we got a bomb shell. Yeah. It's not made out of steel, but it's made out of feathers. Under his wings we rest. Yeah. Amen. And it's not down here, it's up there. You get above it when you sail into the soar into his bosom. Sure. That's the escape. Let me drop this in. I hope my watch don't alarm too quick. But look, listen. The people today are scared to death of communism. Well, what are you scared of communism? I want any theologian, any Bible scholar to show me where communism will rule the world. I tell you, Romanism is going to rule the world according to the Bible. You watch about that. Don't watch iron curtains and bamboo curtains, but watch the purple curtain. That's the one that's going to get you. Don't you never worry about that. that. You just mark that down and say, Brother Branham said it and put it in your Bible and see if it's right. Communism is nothing but a tool in God's hand playing right up. Well, it won't mount to nothing. It's exactly right. Don't fear about that. That's something to throw you off the track of looking. But Bible readers and men who love God stay with what the Bible said. Amen. Certainly. Just watch that. Now, we won't receive God's gift in this nation, this generation. They've turned it down. The people who believe in it is called fanatics, cranks, holy rollers, and everything else. They're despised and rejected, just what the Scripture said they would do. Trady, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truth speakers, false accusers, incontinent, despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. It's exactly what the Holy Spirit said would happen in the last days. And we're here, friends. We're here. Exactly. Many other scriptures we could tie in with it. Let's go on to another thing, what Jesus said here. And as in the days of in the days of Solomon, God sent a gift among his people. And there was one time they accepted it. They accepted Solomon, the gift of discernment. And when the discernment was up on Solomon, everybody was one heart and one accord. Every, while every nation feared, they didn't have no war. Yes. They, they didn't have any wars because they was afraid of Israel. Yes. Not so much the nation as it was the God they were serving. Amen. They were in one heart and one accord. And they all rallied around that gift. Oh, how they all liked it and everybody talking good again. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every Christian tonight in America would all go to talking about the Holy Ghost and how wonderful it is? And so, yeah. why well, I tell you, it would be why well, wouldn't it make newspapers everywhere and lines would burn up <laughs> just from sending the news? Oh, how wonderful it'd be! But they won't do it. See? But oh, if we just rally around the gifts of God, the Holy Spirit. Now we find out that everybody in that day rallied around, and God made this man that had this gift up on him. The king, why, you know, news scattered everywhere. The people brought in herds of sheep. They brought in cattle and gold and everything and helped them. They were trying to find peace with them is what they were trying to do. Because they know that a living God was with a living people. And they knew that. Now notice what's taking place. News scattered them days by 
thank God they didn't have television, but they had lit the ear. And the, the caravans would come through and go somewhere and they'd talk about it. And after a while, the news come way down into Sheba. Mark on your map how far that is from Jerusalem down to Sheba. They had a queen down there, a little pagan heathen queen. And people come by and would give testimony of what was going on up in Palestine. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. Amen. Oh, this little lady was ordained to eternal life. And as soon as she heard this, something caught fire in her little pagan heart. She began to wonder about that. Next caravan come through, she couldn't hardly wait. She'd have her eunuchs to go out and get them and bring them in. Uh, which way did you come? We come from the north. Did you pass through Palestine? Yes. Oh, I know what you're going to ask me about their God. Yes, that's right. Did you see it? I saw it. It's the truth. You, well, they love that man so well, they made him the king. And their God, they got a supernatural God that's displaying himself right to that man. Now, anyone knows... I'm going to turn this off just a minute. Just really, really time. I, it's all right? Just a minute? Yeah. <laughs> anyone knows that heathen worship is the heathen brings out the idol. A priest brings him wine. He eats to this idol. Then he gets out in the temple, prostrates himself before this idol, keeps working himself up like that until actually he believes that he can hear that idol speaking to him. Now, that's absolutely heathen worship. You old brother know that by taking history. Now, look how God does. He turns right back around and don't see you. They think that the, the life, the spirit that ought to be that really belongs in that idol, comes in that idol and speaks back to him. Why, it was said that pagans in the old days could prostrate themselves in such a way they claimed they could hear the gods talk out of them idols. But see how much different Christianity is? How mocker that is to it? God don't take an idol, he takes a man. And the man will prostrate himself in the presence of God. God puts himself in the man, and the man becomes the living creature that God's living in. Not a dead idol, but a man. God never used idols. He always used man. God don't use machinery and mechanical devices. He uses man, individuals. Excuse me, I didn't mean to holler that loud. Notice, I'm not excited, though. I know right where I am. Right. I just feel good. Notice, then, this God had come down, great Jehovah, and was manifesting himself through a man that they knowed it was more than man. There was something about him that was was different. And the people all worshiped God and believed God. And they built the temple. They'd done great things in that day. Notice, this little queen began to hear of it. Faith cometh by hearing. Her little heart began to beat fast. She must go up and see it. So after a while, so many come through testifying. Everybody telling how that people were one heart and one accord. There was no differences in them. It wasn't one walk around and say, oh, he don't belong to mine. He, he's a Pharisee. I don't think I'm a Sadducee. Nothing to that. It was one heart and one accord. That's where you have to be. Oh, oh, if our churches could only get that way. Baby. If our churches, our differences could just be, all right, it's all right as long as you believe and have God and have your, your churches and things. But, oh, let's be one accord, one man, one onward Christian soldier, just one unit of God marching on to victory, receiving everything that comes in the name of the Lord that is the Lord's word promised to send us. Believe it. Act Amen. upon it. Amen. Now, First thing you know, her little heart got to beating so that she just couldn't stay. She couldn't sleep at night. She just had to go see it. There's something another about when you ever hear about God. Man knows that he come from out of the dark curtain. Somewhere beyond here. They know that when he dies, he goes back through that curtain. Where did he come from? And where did he go? Man has always longed to see what was behind that curtain. Exactly. So when he sees something rise from behind that curtain and illustrate something that's been promised him over there, it ought to thrill his heart. Yeah. Notice. So this little woman, she was, her heart began to beat to go. Now, she had some things to do before she went. Now, the first thing she had to do was to go get permission from her church to leave to go up there. Now, that was a hard thing to go to a pagan priest. I can see him when he, she walked up and... and um, she bowed to him and called him uh, whatever she did, the Holy Father or whatever it was. Walked up to him and bowed and he bowed and he, she was the queen of the land. 
She said, I understand through the caravans and so forth, and some of them has brought me scrolls down from up in Palestine, that they're having a great meeting up there, and there's a man up there that's been anointed by their God, and that God is acting his own life through that man. Sir, Holy One, I would like to go see. Could you imagine him giving her permission? <laughs> We're not cooperating with that meeting up there. Oh, sure, all kinds of words could have come. Now, if there's anything that went on, it would went on right here in your own church. And after all, that's just a bunch of nothing. We heard of them crossing seas and everything like that, but it's a bunch of holy rollers or, excuse me, fanatics or something, you know, up there. They, there's nothing to it. Don't you believe it? Nothing to it. If there's anything going to go on, it would go on right here amongst your own church. Right here it would be. If there's anything, anything that a God would do, our God would do it. I could see that little queen rear herself back. She'd say, sir, but I want to go. I want to be convinced. I like that kind of a courage. I want to be convinced. I've got the scrolls here. I want to go to see if that spirit that's in that man is just exactly what these scrolls say that that God is. Yeah. So then if it is, it's that God speaking through the man. Now look here. Here's great God Dagon. Here's great God uh, so-and-so, Jupiter, the sun God, and all these others we have around here. She said, yes, my great-great-grandmother served him, my grandmother served him, all my mother served him. And what have they done? They're dumb idols. I've never heard them speak a word or do a thing. Yeah. It's about yeah. like some of these dumb creeds that we're serving today and so yeah. forth and uh, things that's gotten more life to it. They call, talk about a God, a God that was, and send a boy to school and teach him to be a minister and tell him about a historical God. What good's a historical God of yesterday if he isn't the same God today? Amen. If a God full of mercy could meet the people's needs yesterday, if he ain't the same God today, he's a poor God. He had respect a person. What good does it do to feed your canary bird all kinds of good vitamins to make good strong wings and big heavy bones and put him in a cage right. so he can't fly? Same thing as send a man away and take all kind of schooling and everything and learn what one God was and what all he did and what all he did there. But then turn around and tell him the days of miracles is past. No such a thing. Yeah. That's not even intelligent to me. So that little queen might have said, I've heard about all them gods. I've heard about all them things, but I've never seen a move of life out of them. I've never seen one thing done to act like a god or nothing else. Well, now let me tell you something, my daughter. If you go up there, you are a queen. You can't go amongst a bunch of people like that. Silly. I might as well say it's burning me up anyhow. I was, my daughter-in-law and wife was downtown this morning. And they were buying some stuff in a store. And a lady said, there's a lady across the street here from me. Her husband has a business over here. She was up to that meeting over there the other night, and she had some kind of something on her leg, and it was uh, that man in the pulpit was telling that one about that, and you were left, and he thrilled her to death. My daughter-in-law said, that's my father-in-law. I said, that's my father-in-law. I said, uh, have you been up? I said, oh, no, I couldn't go up. I said, well, why can't you go up? She said, my husband is a deacon of one of the big churches here in the city. I couldn't go around a bunch of people like that. My daughter-in-law said, but you're welcome to come anyhow. Amen. Then you talk about clans. Yeah. Why you holler about the Catholic. Yeah. Why you're the same thing. Yeah, that's right. See? Amen. It's just exactly the same. Right. Pot can't call kittle back. You know that's right. Why, it's the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. Because isn't one God the Father of us all? Yeah. Amen. Why would our denomination separate us? Why would some minister with some uh, degree of college would try to uh, keep a woman that really needs healing in her body to come from a place and get healed by a God that he claims he knows? That's what I want to better. That little queen looked around at that and said, but I've been hearing about all this, but I've never seen nothing yet. Well, if you go, we'll go to excommunicate you. Well, you just might as well give me my papers now because I'm going. See, when Christ begins to move at a heart, it's gone. That's all. So, remember, she had a lot to confront her. She had a lot. Now, she lost her membership. And another thing, she said, I thought it was very good. She said, if that thing is the truth, it's worth supporting. Yeah. So she gathered up a lot of money, frankincense, gold, silver, and mirror, and put it on the camels. But here was her thought, I believe. If it's the truth, I'll support it. Yeah. If it isn't, I can bring my treasures right back. Yeah. She could teach Pentecostal people something. Yeah. Supporting radio ministries out here that would make fun and laugh at the very religion that you are representing. Yeah. That's right. And your yeah. own church suffering for the tithe that you ought to be giving them. Right. Yes, sir. Just because they got some kind of a big name or something like that. Have you never learned spiritual things yet? We should. <laughs> That's right. We should learn to discern the Spirit to see where it comes from. Now, that's not skim milk. 
Now, if you can dissolve it. Notice, now this little woman, she said, I'll support it if it's right. If, if it's right, it's worth everything. If it isn't right, it's no good at all. So she could bring her gifts back. Now, remember, she had a long ways to go. And she couldn't travel. She had to cross the Sahara Desert. Not in an air-conditioned Cadillac, but on the back of a camel. You know how long it takes that caravan to come from where she was to Palestine? It'd take them three months. Ninety days on the back of a camel. No wonder Jesus said she'll rise in the judgment day and condemn this generation. Some people won't walk across the street to see the same thing. Yeah. Right. Amen. Right. And another thing, remember, the sons of Ishmael was robbers in the desert. And she just had a little band of soldiers, eunuchs. How easy they could have fell in on her and killed them little eunuchs and taken her treasures and gone on. But you know, if you are determined to seek God, God will make a way for you. And there's no fear at all about nothing. You just have one achievement, one thought, one motive, one objective, and that's get to God. And if God spoke to you, you'll go out. I don't care what takes place. God will make a way for you to do it. You really have anchored and know what you're speaking of. And she did. She got her maids together and her eunuchs and they all got on the camels and she traveled maybe by night. It was so hot through the desert. I can imagine in the daytime setting up under the shade somewhere in some little oasis under some trees taking those scrolls and reading them. To see, she wanted to know when she got there if it was scriptural. And when she come, she didn't come like a lot of us do here. We'll go to the meeting once. The neighbors, i got a good neighbor lives down here. They invited us. and So we'll go over. And I'll sit five minutes. And if he says one thing that's contrary to what I believe, I'll get right up and walk out. That shows ignorance. That don't even show good sense. Anybody that's raised good wouldn't do a thing like that. If I went in a Buddha temple, if I went in the temple, I'd be gentleman enough to sit there till at least that meeting was over. Right. You talk about some of the ignorance of Kentucky. <laughs> talk about that state that I come from. The ignorance of those people down there. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. Let one of their daughters come in of a morning with her hair all twisted up and manicure over her face all night long with some little Ricky with a flat top haircut. I tell you, she'll, she'll know the next time she goes out. <laughs> a barrel flat or a limb off of a hickory there and just skin her down. And I'll tell you, you all talking about juvenile delinquents. There's so many papers talking about it. I think it's parent delinquency. Take a young one out there and just shuck him down a little bit. You wouldn't have so much then. Poor little Ricky. You're a nice. You didn't mean to do bad, Martha. She needs a good beating. That's what she needs. Yeah. The Bible said, spare the rod, you spoil your child. And that's exactly right. You'll never find nothing any better. On my home, they had the Ten Commandments hanging up over the door on a hickory stick about that long. And, brother, I had all ten of them across my back and up down my legs pretty every day. It done me good. Old. And I tell you, Pop tucked me out behind the house and I danced a little jig, but I know not to do it the next time when he got through with me. It'd be a whole lot better life. We had some more daddies to do that today. He never struck me one lick, but what I honor him tonight for it. When I looked in the casket and seen his gray hair on the side of his head, I stood there and tears dropped upon his face. I said, Daddy, I'll help put him there. God help me. That's right. I respected my daddy. He was a daddy that would make me do right. Praise. Yes, sir. We need more like that today. Yes. Now, she come up. She stopped in front of the, the palace. She unloaded her camels and put her maids down there and put up her tents. And she come to stay till she was convinced. Oh, Praise. brother, no wonder she'll condemn this generation. Amen. Mm -hmm. yes. She come to stay till she was convinced. And she waited. Now, the first morning... I can hear the trumpets sounding, the bells are ringing, and the little queen dressed herself, went in, and maybe she had to take a seat way back in the back. And everything went along fine, all the singing, all the choir sang. Then Pastor Solomon walked out into the pulpit. And she noticed how marvelous her little heart began to burn. Well, that day, maybe at the book stand, she must have bought some books on it. She went back out that night, and she read, and she read. The next day, she, day after day, finally her prayer card was called. She didn't even blow up about it. She waited for her turn. <laughs> and when it come to a place to when she stood before Solomon, the Bible said that there was nothing hid from Solomon but what he made known to her. Amen. Amen. Solomon, a spirit of discernment. 
told her the secrets of her heart. Amen. Jesus said that that queen will rise in the judgment and condemn that generation because they're greater than Solomon is there. Look what she said. We're closing. Look what she said. She said, all that I heard was right and more than I heard. See, the miracle had been performed on her then. See, she was from Plum down in Sheba, and he was a Jew up here. And so he knew nothing about her. But when she stood in his presence, he revealed all the secrets of her heart, told her the things that she wanted to know. Everything was in her heart. God made Solomon know about it. Don't you see? That same God, how could you call it telepathy? How could you call it a devil? When you don't realize that I stand here and know what you're thinking about out there? Amen. How can you doubt? How, what is the matter with my people? What? Yeah. Can't you see that same God is the same nature all the way down to the Amen. Bible everywhere? Amen. And she turned around and she said, Blessed is the man that's with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That stands here and can see that great gift of God working every day. How blessed are these eyes that sets and sees it. Jesus said she'll raise up in the judgment and condemn this generation. For she came from the utmost parts of the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And a greater than Solomon is here. And Christian friends, look, a greater than Solomon is here. The Holy Spirit himself is here. Christ in the form of the Holy Ghost. Is here with us, proving that the same, even what Solomon had, only many times greater, yes. is here today with 2,500 years of history of the same Spirit working in the church. Amen. Amen. A greater than Solomon is here. Her heart was touched. She hadn't seen nothing before. It wasn't common to her. She knew it was right. Let me say something here. Just a moment. When people, real, genuine people, can see something real, it changes their opinion. That's right. And really, a lot of the world today is hungering to see what we're turning down. That's right. Right. They want to see something real. This little story, it might come in just handy right now, I want to say it. You all, you know that I hunt. I, I'm, I love to hunt. My mother's uh, just passed away recently. She's almost a half Indian. And I, I've hunted all my life. First thing I ever bought, I dropped sweet potato plants all day and got a quarter. Bought me a steel trap, caught a rabbit. Sold a rabbit for 15 cents and bought me two more steel traps. Started right off in the business. I was only about six years old. I've been hunting, trapping ever since. And I go up into the north woods to hunt. Used to up there. And way up. And I had a good hunting partner up there. And he was a dandy hunter. Real good shot. And a man that you didn't have to worry about getting him lost in the woods, he knowed how to get out of there. And I used to love to hunt with him, but he was so cruel-hearted. He, he had eyes like a lizard. You know how them funny-looking eyes like women try to paint theirs today, you know, li- lizard-eyed like. And so she, uh, he was a very fine man, but uh, he was cruel. He used to kill fawns just to make me feel bad. He, just, he knowed I... Uh, now, it's all right to kill a fawn. That's all right. If the law lets you kill a fawn, my hunter brothers, that's right. Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God, and God eat it. That's right. Yeah. So the sex or the size has nothing to do with it. But just to kill, just for the fun of killing, that's a murder. Yeah. I don't believe in destroying things. A seven years of game more than myself, as you know. So now, remember, always be honest and right with those things. And um, here was, um, he'd shoot these little fawns and maybe not even pick them up. Just to make me feel bad. Just cruel hearted. I tried to talk to him about God and I mentioned God. He'd just stand there and laugh with his head back. So, but way down in him, I thought there was something might be good in a man. You don't, don't ever turn a man down altogether. Just try your best. Keep on. Let God do the turning down. So, I, um, I, one day I went up there and it was late in the season. And, uh, them white-tailed deer up there, my, you talk about Houdini being an escape artist. He was the amateur side of them. And anyhow, when they'd been shot at, they were just vanished. And moonlight night, they'd feed at nighttime and crawl under brush in the day, get back in a thicket. you never find them. And there'd come a nice little snow that night, about six or eight inches, good tracking weather. And um, we were tuck off for hunting. We'd always carry a thermos bottle full of um, hot chocolate 
Whether if we got turned around somewhere in the woods or killed a deer and had to walk back or got in a snowstorm, that chocolate helped keep you alive. It's better than coffee or anything because it's got a, a fuel to it and a uh, nourishment, the chocolate. So I had a, we each one had a quart in our shirt and a sandwich. And we'd walked all morning, hadn't even seen one track. And we were long about 11.30 or 12 o'clock. We come to a little opening about the size of this building here. And um, he, he was ahead of me walking. And we'd usually go way up into the, above the timber lines. Then we'd, he'd split and we'd go one way and another and walk down through. And if we got a deer, we'd hang it up. And we know when we come back to base camp, we'd be back there that night. Or if we wasn't, we didn't worry about one another. We'd know how to take care in the woods and we'd be back the next day. So then um, I thought he was fixing to leave because we were getting pretty high up. And the deers usually run up the uh, mountain when they were scared. And so then uh, he stopped at this little place and sat down. And I thought he was reaching back in his shirt to get a hold of this thermos bottle to, uh, to eat her lunch. And they would separate and go back. So um, instead of that, he brought out this little old whistle. He had made a little whistle that sounded just like a little baby deer crying for its mammy. You know how, you know how fawn goes, that little funny noise. Well, he had fixed him a whistle that sounded just exactly like that. And I said to him before we left that morning, I said, Bert, you wouldn't use that. He said, oh, you're like all the rest of preachers. You'll never make a hunter. You're too chicken hearted. Said, uh, uh, don't. said you're, you preachers are too chicken hearted to be hunters. And usually I had to get his game anyhow. <laughs> but, but however, he, he was going to shoot this uh, little deer. So he reached down his shirt and he pulled out this whistle. I said, you wouldn't do that. He said, oh, get next to yourself, Billy. Get next to yourself. There's a snow drift there. And he blowed this little whistle. And I thought, well, we hadn't seen a track that wouldn't hurt nothing. But to my surprise, about as far as across this building, a great, big, beautiful, white-tailed doe stood up. Now, that's the mother deer, doe. Her big ears standing out like that. Her big, beautiful eyes looking. What was the matter? No matter how good she was hid, a baby, her baby cried. It was in distress. She jumped up. She began looking around. Now, we wasn't standing over 30 yards from her. He looked up to me at them lizard eyes, and I thought, oh, my. And he blowed it again. And that deer walked right out into that opening. Now, anyone that hunts deer knows that's absolutely unusual. They won't do that, especially when they've been shot at. And that time of day, too, about 11 o'clock, 12. She walked right out in the opening. And I looked at her, and I began to think, that mother, he's deceiving her. He's blowing that whistle like a little baby crying, her baby. And she's not a hypocrite. She's not just acting. She's not putting on something. But she's born a mother. Yeah. It's instinct in her. She's a mother. And that's a baby crying. Yeah, yeah. She was a genuine born mother. It was in her. She stepped out there again. He looked at me again like that. I nodded my head like that. I Reached down, I heard that shell go up in that 306, big 180 grain mushroom bullet. Leveled out that telescope. I knew in a few moments when he touched that trigger, he was a dead shot. I knew he'd blow her loyal heart plumb through her. And how could he do that? I thought, a cruel hearted a man is that. Would take that mother there, trying to find her baby, out there looking for her baby, and would blow her loyal heart right out of her. I thought, what a cruel fellow that must be. Surely he won't do it. And when the, the boat went out on the Model 70, went out like that, the deer heard it. And she turned. And she saw the hunter. But did she move? No, sir. Why? She was a mother. Death or no death, her baby was in trouble. She was trying to find that baby. She was looking everywhere. The baby was calling. She couldn't help that. She was a mother. I, I, I was almost crying. I just turned my head. Oh, God, I can't see that. How can he do that? Blow the heart of that poor old mother out there and her standing looking for her baby. A genuine display of loyalty. And how can he do it? He leveled down like that. That steady nerve. I turned my back. I said, Heavenly Father, down in my heart, don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. How can he do it? How can he shoot the heart of that mother out like that? And her trying to find her baby like that. And I waited and the gun never fired. I waited a little longer. The gun never fired. And I turned around to look, and here's the way the gun barrel was going. Just shaking. And he looked up, and the tears running down his cheeks. His lips are quivering. He tucked the gun and threw it down on the snowbank, grabbed me around the trouser leg, and said, Billy, I've had enough. Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. 
He's a deacon in a Baptist church now. Right there on that snowdrift, I laid him to Christ. Why? He saw something real. He saw something that wasn't put on. He saw there was something genuine. He knew there was something behind it. She was a mother. She was a born mother. God, make me a Christian like that. Make me to be a Christian. So that I can be so real that people who are looking for something real can see something real and know that Christ is real. Let us bow our heads. How many in here, be honest. Just a minute, will you? Be honest. How many of you would like to be the kind of, as much a Christian as that dear was a mother? Raise up your hand. Say, it's me, Brother Branham. I, I want to be that kind of Christian. God bless you. Heavenly Father, how little did I know standing there in that snow that day, my feet wet. That man holding me around the legs, just snubbing and crying. Well, I guess the deer's still there with her baby. I hope so. Little did she know what she was doing. But God is able of these stones to speak out. That cruel-hearted man saw something real. He had seen so much make-belief and put on. To be a hunter himself, God had to deal with him in that way. To see that there was something that was real. And if he's living yet today, a lovely Christian, born again, how we thank you for that, Father. I've seen some three or four, five hundred hands, maybe close to maybe more than that, go up a few moments ago that they, they wanted to be a real Christian, Lord. I've had to scold this week, God, cry over it, wonder just what my brethren are thinking. Wonder what you're thinking. But well, try to be honest, Lord. The people sat and wondered. May it all be over now, Lord. May it just all be broke up and settled. May we come to the God that we know it's real. We each one can have that experience of being a real born Christian, just as much as that dear was a mother. Grant it, Lord. Hear us, I pray. Each one with your head bound, your eyes closed. I want you to just say in your heart, just pray a little prayer. God, be merciful to me. That's right. Just have faith. Don't doubt. Oh, God, each one of you that feels that Christ is near you, just raise up your hand. Say, I, I just believe he's real near me tonight. I just feel his presence. God bless you. Just keep praying. That's right. God, how I long to see it. Just have faith, believe. Make me a Christian, Lord. Just like, just as much Christian as that, as that dear was a mother. How many's never been in a meeting before? Raise up your hand. Never been in a meeting. Well, God bless you, many. Raise your heads just a minute if you're finished praying. <clears throat> I want you to look this away. I talked this week of a Jesus that's a living I ain't told you from a creed I've told you by a Bible by his word I give you his promise that he's the same yesterday today and forever you believe that yes, amen. Now, if he if you could see something real you'd want it wouldn't you don't you don't want nothing bogus you want something real May God show you tonight, right here, that I've told you the truth. He's Messiah living. Don't doubt now. You believe. 
look this way and say in your heart to Christ, you're that high priest. I believe it. Remember, let me plainly make it. I'm not the high priest. I'm just your brother. He's the high priest. My touch will mean nothing. His touch will do it. Your touch is what he's waiting on. Your touch. Your faith touch. And if he did that in his day, he'll do it again today. Don't you believe it? Amen. That man sitting there with high blood pressure, hand up to his jaw, you believe that God would grant your healing of that high blood pressure, sir? You believe it? Raise up your hand and say, I'll accept it. Hallelujah. I don't know the man, but that's true. The lady sitting next to you there has a female disorder also. She'll believe with all her heart. You believe it, sister? Raise up your hand. Is that something real? That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That woman that could touch back there by the feeling of her infirmities, that woman touched too. Just don't doubt. Have faith. Lady sitting right down here. She has cancer. She's praying for her cancer. Also, she's got a, a grandchild she's praying for. The grandchild is retarded. You believe that God will heal? I'm a stranger to you. If that's right, wave your hands like this. Now, why didn't you have that kind of faith last night, you old? Just believe. Don't doubt. Put your hand on that lady right next to you. Will you do me a favor? She suffers with a throat trouble. Just have faith. <laughs> See how easy it is if you just believe it? Amen. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. Isn't he good and wonderful? Isn't that real? Man sitting right over here. He's suffering with complications. Got stomach trouble, liver trouble. God don't let him miss it. Mr. Brines, bleed. You got it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's too sweet now. Don't don't do nothing to interrupt it. Let it be gone. I don't know the man. I've never seen him. God in heaven knows that. And here's my Bible over my heart. He just strike me dead this minute. What's he touch? Who did he touch? Jesus. Ever who that was over there? If we don't know one another and we're strangers, raise up your hand. Ever who the person was. Any of the people that's been called, if we're strangers to one another, raise up your hand. We don't know one another. Raise up your hands, ever who is them people has been. They were just called just now. Uh, sure. See. What about somebody in this way? Lady sitting there looking right at me. She's scared to death of that cancer. She's wondering. You're wondering if it's you. Is it me? That's the one you're talking to. I'll tell you who it is. Your name is Mrs. Brown. Now, you know who I'm talking to now. You believe that God's healed you? If you do, raise up your hand and say, I accept it. God bless you. Hallelujah. That alcoholic that you're praying for you believe you tried with all your heart but it didn't work so good but don't you worry he knows about it now if that's true wave your hand like this nobody knows that but you and God and me I don't know what you're praying about you must believe you must have faith don't doubt That colored lady sitting there by you from Portland. Yes. You believe with all your heart? Respect you and you can go home and be well too. Jesus Christ heals you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. You believe in something real here tonight? Amen. Amen. Who is it? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Don't you believe that? Amen. Now, if you want to be a real Christian, you believe me. How could I stand here? How could the Holy Spirit work like this through here to, to a hypocrite? You think God would honor a hypocrite? No, sir. I surely got some conception of him in the 20, 31 years of service around the world seven times. Surely there's all kinds of... God wouldn't permit that. I'm telling you the truth, friend. Amen. This is truth. And it's honest truth. Now, I know it's right now. I'm way past. I, was going to, I told you to call in prayer cards. But it's almost 10 o'clock. I don't know where the time goes. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get this way. I'm just going to do this. So help me. God has been told That angel of God that you see on that picture... Right now, right here at the platform. Hallelujah. That's thus saith the Lord. Yes. See something real. Believe it. Amen. If I have to stand here tomorrow afternoon until the sun goes down until 10 o'clock tomorrow night, I'll pray for every person that wants to be prayed for has that part. If you just don't let me keep you too long tonight. I wonder something. I was going to ask you a question. Each one of you that knows that you're not a, as much Christian as that mother was, as that dear was a mother, while you see something right in your face here, I've seen something happen right there again, that woman sitting right there. Here's that man with that prostrate trouble, getting up at night. God bless you, brother, it's over. That's just whirling everywhere. Hallelujah. It's just going everywhere. If, when, I, when that unbeliever saw something real, he was ready to repent right there. Yes. I wonder tonight if we couldn't have a good consecration service right now. Yes, Lord. Let me pray first for you where you're sitting. Let me pray over these handkerchiefs. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I lay my hands upon these handkerchiefs. Bless them. These and Heavenly Father, there's many sick out in the audience. There's many praying for their loved ones and feel it, see it. They see there's something going on, Lord. I'm getting weak, weaker all the time. I pray, God, help me. Now help me to pray a prayer of faith for them, God. They sat here and suffered it out through heat. Many of them come through difficult. Don't, don't let them miss it tonight, God. You're here to do it. Let, let him see it real. Father God, one day there was a little boy herding his father's sheep. We know him as David. He was interested in his father's sheep. He had given a charge over them sheep. And he must watch them. None of them must be lost. And a lion come in and got one. Little David didn't have a magnum rifle. He only had a slingshot, but he trusted in you. He went forward. He got that little sheep that that lion took. He slew the lion and brought the sheep back to shady green pastures and laid him down with the still waters because it was his father's sheep. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight, diseases like heart trouble, cancer, tuberculosis, cripples, them devils of lions is coming and got some of your sheep. He's dragging them out. They've drugged through every doctor's office and clinic. He's dragging them out. I'm going after him tonight, Lord. Thank you. I ain't got nothing but this little slingshot of prayer, but you promised the prayer of faith will save the sick. They're your sheep, and I'm coming after them. Satan, you're going to have to turn them loose. I'm bringing them back tonight. Through a prayer of faith, turn them loose and let them alone. I claim them for the Lord God in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. May your grip of unbelief break across this building and every one of them be healed. Grant it, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Don't doubt it. Believe it. Do you believe it? Raise up your hand. Say, I believe it, Brother Branham. I believe it. If God can stand here and use for this, didn't he also say the prayer of faith shall save the, save the sick? You use it in all ways. Now, how many in here that don't know God and wants to become a Christian, raise up your hand. Just say, I want to raise my hand, Brother Branham. I want to become a Christian. How many church members here that really knows that you're not living where you ought to live? 
It, there's things that you just can't understand. You're, you're all mixed up. You don't know what to do. And you would really like to be a real Christian. Raise your hand. Say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you. I wonder why we sing a song, if our organist will give us the card. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. I wonder, just as many that believes that God would hear my prayer, and you have a need of God for such, won't you come and say, I'm surrendering my life, soul, but I see something real, something that's out of the Bible real. And I'm coming up tonight and stand around the altar. I'm coming to make my stand right now. And from this day henceforth, so help me God, I'll dedicate my life to Him. I'll be a better member in my church. I'll be a more consecrated Christian. From this hour on, I sell out to everything of the world. I'm going to be a real Christian from this hour on by the grace of God. I'm coming up, Brother Brandon, to stand here. I want you to pray for me. Will you come while we sing? Congress, rise right up and come. God bless you. That Whoever you are, come right on now. That's it. Consecration. That's what we want. I Do you really love him? Is your soul anything to you now? Love him. Because I'll try to shake hands with you. what he did when he was here, and he would do it again if he was standing here while this day is going on. Won't you come? I love Everybody sing. Let's raise your hands. I love you. servant, he that will confess his sin. But if I regard iniquity in my heart, the God will not hear my prayer. What is iniquity? Iniquity is something that you know that you are doing that you ought not to do and still won't repent. If I regard iniquity in my heart, knowing that I should do it and don't do it, then God promised, the Bible promises that God will not hear your prayer. If you know you should do it and won't do it. Is that right, brother? Is that right, brother ministers? It's true. If you regard iniquity. Now, if you belong to these churches, you say, well, there stands my pastor. He believes me to be a Christian. Right. Come consecrate yourself over your pastor. Be happy for it. Yes. Certainly you will. He'll be happy to know. He knows the real sincerity and the desire of your heart is to do that's what's right. I have, with my church, I sure would. And you are my church. The whole world's my parish. So you are my church.
just bow our heads now, humming. Mm. Don't we get among the people down here now? Everybody praying. How you come here? Now the only thing that you can do is confess. From your heart, confess your own. And believe. Now God see you walk up here. And he's seen you walk up here. He was the one who spoke to you. He knows your heart. He spoke. And you come forward. He sees you right now. You confess your wrongs to God. Help me tonight, Lord. I'll do it again. By your grace, I'll stand true to you to the end of the world. I'll be your servant. Now let everybody in the audience bow and pray. Oh God, our Father. We are approaching thy throne of grace. Standing around this altar tonight stands some large group of people. Many of them are members of churches. Some of them maybe have never made a confession yet. Some of them has made it and failed. But God, I know you have confidence in a man that while he's trying, he fails and then enough soldier to rise up on his feet and try again. God, I pray that you'll answer every one of their requests. They're standing here now, their heads bowed, their hearts bowed, they're believing you. You're their God, they're confessing they're wrong, and they're, they're wanting to be right, Lord. They want all unbelief to be taken away from them. Let the little besetting sin that does so easily upset them, let it be taken from them tonight, never to return again. I plead for each of them. You watched them when they raised from their seat, come down from the balcony, come down out of the aisles. You said, well, that, I could have stood back there and done just as well. God, the altar call was to come up here. And that showed that they wasn't ashamed to admit they're wrong. And they are come confessing before God and the holy angels, confessing before their fellow man that they've been wrong and they want to be right. When they walked up here, they, their own walking up here made their confession. Now, you promised that they'd be forgiven, and I know they are, Lord. And I turn them to you now as your servant in a word of prayer, believing, feeling in my heart the great Holy Spirit is well pleased with what they've done. And I pray, God, that they'll live a victorious life all the rest of their days. The rest of their days may be full of victory. May Satan, may sickness leave them. May there not be a thing bother them, and may they serve you all the days of their life. And someday, if you tarry, and they go down to the hour of death, and the old chilly winds begin to break across the bedside, or the cold vapors of the Jordan catching across their face, we know that the old ship of Zion will blow her whistle, and she'll come by and pick up that pilgrim to take it across the river. Grant it, Lord. Land them in the, the land of promise safely. Give them eternal life, Lord, and raise them up at the last days. Grant it, Lord. May tomorrow each of these church members go to their church with a shining face and a testimony to the glory of God that they found a new anchor tonight, and they are now dedicated Christians to your service. In Jesus' name, I commit them to you. With my prayer and all, oh, Lord, if I've found grace in your sight, take each one of them. I give them to you with all my heart. In Jesus' name. Now, the ones that's around the altar here, that's come up to make your confession that you have been wrong and you believe that God forgives you, I want you to raise up your hands like it. Raise up your hands. Say, I feel in my heart that God has forgiven me. And from this night on, I pledge that I will serve God and better the rest of my days. Now, I want you to turn right around to the audience. Just turn right around. All you at the altar. Turn right around to the audience. Right around this way. Now, raise up your hands again towards the audience and say to this, pray for me. Say it with me. Pray for me. All the, the people standing here, repeat after me. Pray for me. That I will always be true to God. I am your brother and sister. And I serve God. Now I deserve your prayer. Now all of you out there that will do that, raise your hand down to them and say, My brother and sister, I pray. Now, all of us.
us with our hands up to God. I love you. Don't you worry.